Um, but you're a Miami guy, born, born and raised, right? Born in Miami Beach. I, is the mic working? No. Not really. I was born in Miami Beach. <laughs> um, and so you, you grew up in the real estate world here, right? Yes, my father uh, was in real estate. Okay. And when did you realize that that was something you wanted to do also? Can everyone hear me? Is there, no. Can we get a little more uh, volume on that mic? Testing. Testing. Nope. Now, testing, is that better? Okay. Yeah, okay, there we go. So, um, real estate. I was, I was in law school, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, didn't know if I wanted to uh, become an art dealer or go into real estate. Art seemed impractical, real estate seemed boring, and then um, I discovered South Beach. At the time, there wasn't much there but I kind of saw those Art Deco buildings as sculptures, and so it was a good merger of my art interest and my real estate interest. Okay, and you know, what, what was the scene like in Miami at the time? I mean, it was, it was very different than what it's like now. So, um, the, the whole South Beach area, the Art Deco district, was basically a dwindling retirement village for uh, World War II immigrants that had come to the United States worked in factories and retired on social security. There was also kind of a crack epidemic, so it was basically a dwindling elderly population and um, kind of homeless crack addicts. Okay, so a little, bit, a little bit different than what it's like now. When I told my mom that I had bought and was moving into the Webster Hotel on 12th and Collins, she cried. <laughs> <laughs> What's, um, oh, are we getting a... Uh... Yeah, we're going to swap mics out here. I got upgraded. No. no. Are we... Uh, Testing. Uh, there wow. Are. Hey, there we are. All right, there we go. We have sound. <laughs> Good. You didn't want to hear the first part. It was boring. <laughs> um, so how did, how did you go about changing things? I mean, that's not an easy kind of uh, hole to, to dig out of. What was, what was that process like? Well, I, I bought the first property, and I needed to get a tenant. There were, there were no tenants in South Beach at the time, no businesses. Uh, businesses that kind of catered to those retired elderly people. And the first property I bought was on 5th and Washington. It's a pretty central corner in, in South Beach. And figured, I got to get someone to rent this place. There was actually one tenant. There was this guy who would go behind my building and he would acquire all the tin cans from the homeless people. So he had one commercial operation in South <laughs> Beach at the time. And um, miraculously, the first person that I was able to convince to come and open a store was Keith Haring. And he opened a variation of his pop shop. And then when did things really start to kind of like take off? Like when did you realize that maybe this wasn't like a little project here, a little project there, but something that could be more, more like a movement? There were, there were a couple of moments. Uh, the Cameo Theater had opened and it became a music hall. And I saw this concert with Alpha Blondie playing there. And, and immediately, like, I could feel that something was happening. Uh, this was in the, in the late 80s. Okay. I started in 87. Um, in about 1990, 91, I can't remember the exact date, Chris Blackwell and I opened the Marlin Hotel. And to me, that was like the big turning point. It was a 12-room hotel. We had a Jamaican restaurant, of course, a recording studio, of course, a model agency. Chris had his apartment there. I was living next door in the Webster. And um, we had 12 hotel rooms. And we managed to fill it up uh, for our opening with Naomi, Kate, and Christy flew in, uh, the top models, and also this little unknown band called U2. Yeah, I think, I've, I think I've maybe heard of them before. They were the biggest rock band in the world at the time. I mean, they still probably are one or if not the. And it was amazing. Like, that was the moment where it was clear that something incredible was happening in South Beach. It was really uh, the energy uh, that that created and the interest globally. Uh, there, were, there were two huge magazines for travel at the time, Travel and Leisure and Traveler Condé Nast. And our little 12-room Marlin was the first hotel ever to be on the cover of both. Oh, wow. wow. It was all because of Chris. 
<laughs> Chris was, was a mentor, and he's the founder of Island Records, and obviously his presence and discovery of South Beach, and, and fortunately collaboration with us was a, one of the catalysts that really turned it into an amazing place. And for a property like that, which was obviously very successful, what characterized it as being better than its, what could have been its peers or competition? Well, there, there really weren't like peers or competition. It's not that other things happened, but South Beach was like a rundown area with these unbelievable Art Deco buildings, but no new kind of inhabitants. And it, it first started like to become a destination for the catalog fashion world. So catalogs were produced there, and that's what we did before the Marlin um, with the Webster. It became like a production place. There was also a model agency there, film processing. They would do the layouts for the ads, and, and I lived there. And so you'd walk around, and there were just amazingly beautiful people on every corner of South Beach getting photographs taken. There was nobody else, and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, maybe you'd see like Klaus Oldenburg or Roy Lichtenstein walking down the street or Calvin Klein, but other than that, it was retired other people, crack addicts, and no one else. And of course, it's a different kind of anchor. I know people like to think of Sears or J.C. Penney as an anchor, but we kind of had music and fashion. And so what you did on South Beach, you know, it's, it's a little bit different than what you're doing here, but the, the design district is kind of the next chapter of taking a, a part of Miami that was maybe underused and doing something different and kind of vibrant with it, right? Well, so in South Beach, what you know, I obviously began to focus on neighborhood revitalization. That's what it was. And in that process, we would always go to the next section. So it started off on Ocean Drive, and then, you know, Collins and Washington. And then we went south of Fifth Street. We went up to Espanola Way, eventually went to Lincoln Road. And each of those was like discovering the next neighborhood where we thought growth would happen. I mean, for those of you that know Miami, at, that, at, at this time, people didn't think that Lincoln Road was part of South Beach. They thought Lincoln Road was another neighborhood. And once we had gotten to Lincoln Road and started developing there, I realized that now it was time to go over the bridge. There was no place else for South Beach to grow. And so I started buying property in the design district. One of the things that frustrated me in, in South Beach and that I found really inspiring about the design district while we were by far the largest property holder in the historical district, we own like five or 10%. And when you own a, a small percentage like this, a, a lot of things can happen that you don't necessarily agree with. And so there were like, you know, tacky bars that were opening and things that were incongruous with the, the vision that we had. Um, and that's part of being in a neighborhood. And the design district was small enough and contained enough where we could own like a meaningful percentage. Today we own about 70% of the privately held property in the neighborhood. And by doing that, we could like more, have more influence on the direction. And so it was like, for me, the next Lincoln Road or the next Espanola Way, the next like part of this movement in Miami, uh, which I saw South Beach as, but also an opportunity to really be in a contained area where we could have a bigger influence on driving the, the long-term direction. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. We, we got in yesterday, and I had not been to Miami in, in a couple of years and hadn't been here before, and, and James, same thing. Yeah, same here. And I mean, James, what kind of sense did you get walking around? I mean, it definitely has a unique feel, right? It doesn't feel like anywhere I've ever been. You know, I'm lucky to do a fair amount of traveling, but Miami had escaped my path so far. And it definitely has its abs absolutely. Its We're own unavoidable feeling. at some point. I, I'm happy to be here. It's great, and the, the, <laughs> the, the space is incredible. I mean, you, you really turn a corner, and it's one thing. You turn a corner, it's another thing. There's always something to see, and uh, and it, it has its own energy for sure. Yeah, I mean, I also wonder why. Why do you think this place makes sense beyond the fact that there are obviously boutiques here for these brands? But why do you think a place like this makes sense for an event like like Watches and Wonders? Well, well for, first of all, um, if you look at Palm Court, and there are, are some amazing brands that aren't in Palm Court, but it's, it's obvious that like we, um, inspired by the dedication, creativity, the design and engineering that goes into watches, wanted to make a venue that could showcase that. And I mean, to, to have the kind of design that's here, you know, I mean, Buckminster Fuller is the 
iconic, one of the iconic visionaries of design and engineering. And, 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 and so to have his dome surrounded by all these incredible watch boutiques and jewelry boutiques is, to me, really inspiring. And we were careful. Like, we chose Fujimoto. Um, I think he's one of the most inspiring living architects. He's definitely, like, the kind of architect who hopefully we'll see someday receiving the Pritzker Prize. He's in that, that kind of caliber. And, um, and to have him design the building that would sort of showcase this area um, was an inspiration for us. So we're playing off of each other. And that, that watch industry, like the car industry, like architecture, like the furniture industry that I work a lot with in Design Miami, um, they're, all about, they're all about this design and engineering. And they're very specific. And I think that having a place that, that celebrates that will enhance the overall experience. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, you know, something we think a lot about it at Houdinki is how to put watches in kind of a bigger, a bigger context. And I think a place like this shows that off really, really well. Um, and I wonder how you think about the way, uh, you know, both on a larger scale and maybe just for you personally, how these things interact in, in people's lives. You know, watches, uh, architecture, design, fashion. Well, you know, watches for me fall uh, obviously into the category of being collectibles. They're not just a luxury product, they're, they're, they're something that you can have. And as a collector of art and design, uh, you know, some people collect wine, it involves connoisseurship, people collect cars. Watches fall into that category where the more you know, the more you understand, the, the more interesting they become. You know, some people look at a painting and it doesn't mean anything. I look at a painting and like, when someone's really inventing something or they have invented something hi historically, I respond to it. And the kind of energy that goes into these, you know, very small devices, the amount of talent and engineering that goes into them, it fascinates me. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if you can talk a bit about your own sort of taste in watches. Like, I, I know you've, you've interacted with them both as, as a consumer and also some of your projects. You've, you've had watch brands involved for things like Design Miami and, and here. Um, kind of what's your, what's your personal taste in watches like? All right, so, so first of all, I'm a complete amateur. <laughs> um, so, so I'm not like the, the knowledgeable person, but I find watches fascinating. I, I, um, and, and as you discover them, there's also like watches for different kinds of experiences. And, and, and I find that a very cool thing. And, and watches, um, which began as a, as a functional object, have also transcended that and become something that's collectible. And, um, you know, calling it like jewelry, it would be, I think, inappropriate, but it, it goes into this category of like an accessory that makes you feel kind of cool to have. And, um, and I admire that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, James and I talk a lot about when we're, you know, we both travel a lot. Like, what's the right watch for the, the right occasion? And I mean, James, you have something pretty cool on your wrist today. Oh, yeah, I've got a, it's a, a vintage <laughs> GMT Master in solid gold, and it's all faded out, super brown, real chocolatey. It's, uh, it's something else. It's a lot of fun. It's not mine. I, I took it. The person, <laughs> they're aware it that be, I have it. It might be yours soon. But they're aware uh, that I have it, sort of. But yeah. 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 Well, maybe if we trade, then yours could become mine. We'll and just keep they, they won't know the where. Path. Right. Yeah. They, no, they yeah. won't yeah. be able this to find it. Watch laundry. I'll walk out of here. No one knows me anyway. <laughs> Sorry, James. You, uh, you may never see that watch ever again. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I. Are there any occasions you remember where like a certain watch just felt like the right thing for you or, you know, kind of like enhanced an experience? Well, like, you know, today I'm, I'm wearing Roger Dubuis Lamborghini watch and we're inaugurating watches and wonders and concours. It's, it's like the perfect, yeah, perfect watch for this moment. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Um, I mean, you said that when it comes to watches, you're, you're an amateur, but you are also a pretty serious collector of, of some other things where you are certainly not an amateur. Yeah, let's, um, let's get some tips on yeah, where, where you're, like, where, what the, like the real core, the heart of your collector gene is. Where does that land? Is that in art? So I, I, um, I always bought furniture, but like thrift shop collectible furniture. Um, and I was, I was fascinated by furniture. I also 
like going to Salone in Milan and getting the precursor of limited edition collectible design. You know, you could buy like these amazing things by the Campania brothers. They didn't call it limited edition, but it wasn't, there weren't a lot of them made. Right. Um, and, and, and what I was really inspired by as like a collector, because I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking about design as collecting, was art. Um, and with art, it's this, it's this interesting odyssey. Like if, I think if you're really a collector, what happens is you buy something, you put it up, you interact with it, and then you want to have like more things by that artist because it's inspiring or it leads you to something else. And an example is I was collecting, and I was very young, I didn't have a lot of money, but it was in the late 80s, early 90s, I was collecting uh, a lot of the young California artists. And then I realized like they all had one teacher, John Baldessari, and his work was like expensive, but it wasn't that expensive. And I was thinking like, if I'm collecting all of them, why wouldn't I collect like one of the great conceptual artists of our time, certainly one of the most important living artists in the United States or the world. And so I started to collect John Baldessari. Well, once you're collecting John Baldessari and now you're collecting conceptual art, which is what I was doing, I had to go and then buy a work by the father of conceptual art, Marcel Duchamp. And so that's like an a, example of, uh, of, of how I collect or have Slowly collected. went deeper. Or yeah, like you, you're living with it and growing with it and it's influencing you. And it's interesting for you to say like you got it, when you got into it, you didn't have a lot of money and you were buying things that weren't necessarily that expensive. Do you think that's still the case now? Someone could get into it at basically any level? Yeah, I still feel like I don't have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Well, especially as you, as you kind of level up what your interests are, right? Like it, uh... it's, you know, there, there's like a, a market side to it. Um, I think that people can get inspired. Uh, one of the things that I collect, uh, which is still expensive, but not anything like art, and it's probably the most important kind of thing you can collect in the history of art, or one of them, is Goya's first edition prints. You know, you, could, you can get a Goya's first edition print for probably five maybe $10,000, it's a lot of money, I'm not saying it isn't, but when you think about what art sells for. And, and um, my, my 18 year old son is studying art history in high school right now. So he's studying from the beginning of time until now, all of that. So there's 250 works that they're studying in this class. And one of them is uh, Goya's Disasters of War Etching, No Hay Remedio, which we have on the wall in my house. So I think that money is a, a factor, but there's also ways to collect amazing things and, and you can do it in different budgets. Okay, and if you, were, if you were to extrapolate that to not necessarily just the money, but the taste aspect, what tips would you give someone who's kind of starting out in art or um, let's say the appreciation of architecture to develop your taste? Well, I, I think that whatever it is, um, whether it's watches or architecture or art, um, you need to engage, and so you need to begin to learn, you need to take some risks, um, and then learn from those risks and build. And it's not something that will come to anybody immediately. What will come immediately, or what came to me, was this like connection. Like I, I felt some connection to art that I couldn't explain that was drawing me to it. So that was a, like an intuitive kind of thing. But then you need to build on that with real learning and experience and time. And, and, um, and so it's not just the investment of money, it's the investment of, of time. And time is not even the right word. It's the investment of yourself, your real, your real interior self. Like in making an investment in further enthusiasm, studying, that sort of thing. Yeah, and engaging. You know, like it's, it's uh, when you look at it, does it like resonate with you deeply? I'm not, um, I'm not really a connoisseur of music, but some of my friends can sit and they'll know whether a certain classical concert is a good one or a bad one. I have no idea, you know, like, because I don't connect that deeply with music. I like music, I enjoy sitting in the concert, but I don't understand it and I certainly don't see it mathematically, which, right. which some people can do. And so for you, it's, it's more of a, a gut thing. You were already wired to like the art and, the, and, and, and architecture and such, so getting deeper and deeper into it was just kind of a natural path. I think that real collectors end up having some connection that they can't explain, and yeah. that drives them to go deeper and deeper 
And that's why some people collect wine and some people collect art. Yeah, for sure. Some people collect all of it. They get drunk and then look at the art. They're really happy. <laughs> and the, uh, it's an interesting concept that you use. You, know, you use the word engage a couple times it, because you've, that's literally what you've created here is the ability for someone to walk into an area and engage with these things in a, in a real way, whether that's watches or art or uh, architecture and design. We're, we're, we're trying. We're really working hard. We, the, our team's amazing. And, 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 and part of it is like, doing what we're doing now with watches and wonders and concours to to not just have the place because there's the physical place but then to have the content and celebrate fine watchmaking um and have what what i think you know I, I think we can have the best watch event and high jewelry event in the united states i think that like we can do that and the design district is a perfect place to do that um you know there's there's a lot of those businesses here so it's not like you're just going to some convention center somewhere and like walking into something that's fabricated. We can integrate some of the, the exhibit spaces for people that aren't here in these amazing showrooms. And, 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 and that's what our goal is. Similarly, like with Art Basel, um, you know, we advocated Art Basel from the beginning. Design Miami, the furniture collecting show, which I co-founded, is what started here. Um, it's like part of the DNA of this neighborhood that every year we engage in that moment. And so it's both like a permanent place with uh, amazing stores. You know, you can go to IWC downstairs and have the store, but you can also come here for Watches and Wonders, which is like an augmented moment to focus on it. Or if you're interested in art and design, you can come here during Art Basel. I mean, this year it, it was insane. Like Bono came for the first time in five years uh, yes, that's the same guy who showed up at our hotel, our 12-room hotel in <laughs> 1991. Um, but uh, he came in auction red. And first of all, how proud are we that we're part of, you know, his investment in, in trying to help resolve the AIDS issue in Africa? You know, like, that's, that's a great thing to be associated with. But, but also, it was the first time in five years he did a red auction, and he chose this neighborhood. Um, he chose it because of our connection to Art Basel and also because of what it stands for. And so when you do something that's real, uh, ultimately it may not be immediate or it may not be obvious, but you get the rewards. And like one of them was that Design District helped raise $10.5 million for Red, Bono's charity that supports AIDS in Africa. I mean, that's, that's got to make you immensely proud, not just because of what that represents in and of itself, but because of all the, the work and kind of the, the struggles to get this to a point where it, it can serve as, as a partner and as a venue for something like that. Um, I wonder what, what has that, uh, I guess, journey been like and, and what are some of the challenges that you faced along the way that you, you feel like you've kind of come through and, and come out better for, for having faced? I, I, I love it and, and, and it's like the collecting of art um, I'll get to the challenge part later because that's, but you know, it, it's like one thing leads to another. So we're doing this and we want to make this neighborhood work. And so I was with one of the top marketing people at Cartier and I, I was like, how are we going to get people more engaged? Like, what should we do? And so he told me that we should get in touch with Houdinki. And then I called Ben and we began to talk about something to do. And it like took a few years, but now like we're sitting here collaborating and I mean Houdinki is this amazing company and we're doing something that merits you guys putting your energy into, into coming down here and collaborating with it and being like part of what anchors watches and wonders as an important moment. So what I love is a neighborhood is a place that obviously is about collaboration. Like it has all kinds of different elements in it. It has businesses, it could have people that live here, people that are visiting, and, and weaving together that. And the challenge is when you start from nothing, and uh, I mean, it was a great historical neighborhood, but when I started here, the rents were $5 a foot, and it was 50% occupied. So that's more than nothing. Um, it wasn't gonna pay for this watch I have on, yeah. you know, but it was more <laughs> than nothing. Um. I wonder where, where do you see, before we, we're going to have to wrap up in a bit, but um, where do you see the future, future of this? How do you see this growing? How do you see this kind of weaving itself even more deeply into the, the fabric of, of Miami? 
Well, you know, we really just opened last year because even though a lot of the shops were here, um, it was a massive construction site. And now I think we need to spend the next year or two really solidifying what it is and having a lot more places open, which is what's going to continue to happen, and developing more critical mass, building on, on watches and wonders. You know, I hope we can come back in, in a year or two and say it was amazing what we did in 2019, but oh my God, how much has this grown and how much more vital and important is it? Um, and, and then we have development rights to build a lot more around here. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to, with our whole team and our partners, to brainstorm about that, what that could be. But we can add uh, 2 million square feet of space to this neighborhood um, in a very small area. And what I think is critical is that each thing that we add makes the whole place better. And that'll be residential, hotel, office. Um, but hopefully with a more... Uh, you know, contemporary sort of attitude and, and, and product. Great. Well, we're going to take a couple questions from the audience in just a second. So um, start thinking about what you want to ask. Gray, our producer, will have a microphone. Um, so if you raise your hand, we'll, we'll call you out, and uh, Gray can get you, get you a mic. Um, but before we do that, we always kind of wrap up the show with uh, our Hodinky questionnaire. So just a couple quick fire questions for you. Um, the first one being, what's a watch that's caught your eye recently? Well, the one that caught my eye this week was the Lamborghini watch yeah. by Roger Dubuis. Yeah, perfect. Like you said, it's kind of the perfect fit for this, uh, this weekend. Cars and watches, that's what we're all about. <laughs> um, next up is, what's the best place you've traveled in the last year? Definitely the Grand Canyon, 12 days. Ooh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. That sounds pretty good right about now. Yeah, it was, yeah. was mind-blowing. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given, and who gave it to you? When I was, when I was young, even before I was starting in my business, my, my father told me that the key is to um, always try to minimize the downside of whatever you're doing and have a big upside. So... Um, that's, that's something that has really stuck with me and helped me in, um, in my work. And he's a really brilliant guy, my dad. Great. Uh, and then what's your guilty pleasure? Being in nature. Great. I don't feel that guilty, but it's a pleasure. Yeah, I was going to say, that's not, a, that's not a thing one should feel too guilty well, about. Well, it's like, it's a way, though, of disconnecting from the world and not necessarily attending to the the things that I have to do. So like, if I'm going to indulge myself, like the ultimate indulgence, and that's kind of what guilty pleasures are in a way, yeah. is to be somewhere in nature disconnected from the world, like the Grand Canyon, for example. Great. Cool. Well, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, right there. We gave you intentionally the mic that doesn't work. That's the whole strategy here. We just hit the switch on the mic. Turn it on. Oh, there we go. Yeah, just to, just to repeat the question quickly, just so uh, the folks listening, listening at home can hear. Uh, the question was about public art and kind of what you think the, the benefits are and the, how, how to properly manage that, I guess. So when I was uh, in my 20s, uh, this legendary attorney in Miami, uh, who sadly is no longer alive, um, lived as our neighbor. And um, he knew my parents and knew me. And he had this board called Art in Public Places in Dade County. Um, and it was, uh, it was like, let's say the average age was 50 or 60 on the board, and he wanted someone young. And I was the only one young that he knew that had any interest in art. So I got on this, on this board. And what I learned about like, 
art in public places is that it can be site specific. You know, you can buy a great sculpture and plop it on the square and there's nothing wrong with that. And, or you can do things that are site specific. And so if you look like at Buckminster Fuller's Fly's Eye Dome, it's something that I acquired just randomly from my collection. But then in the center of a plaza, uh, surrounded by all of these amazing things and as a way to go down into a parking garage, it was like, you know, I thought a genius structure, you know, like it was just the, what better way could you have to access a parking garage? And, and generally in the neighborhood, you know, when you think about it, parking is usually the ugliest part of any project. And if you look around here, uh, you want to go to our parking garage, you have to suffer and walk through Bucky's Dome, or you can go, you know, like across the street from the ICA and see the, the, the museum garage, or City View has Baldessari's murals on it. And so, um, it's just finding ways where um, you can optimize the creative side and whatever the environmental needs are and integrating them. Great. Uh, next, next question. Anybody else? Savan, ask a question. Come yeah, on. come on. Savan. I know, it'll be translated. I know. Actually, it's not a question that he has. He's just uh, saying his things about you. He says, I'm taking you as a role model as well. This is my first experience in States, and I'm watching you, and I'm learning from you, he says. That's all. Thank you, Savan. It wasn't a question, but thank you very much. Yeah, we'll I, I, I do appreciate it. All right, and uh, we're going to, oh, we have one more question here. What's your opinion on uh, social media and just media in general like uh, Houdinki and the influences on watches and arts and, and just life in general? I think a lot of us are here, obviously because of Houdinki we were invited. <clears throat> How would things have played out maybe in the 80s when you were around without the influence of the internet? So, so my opinion of social media is please follow me on Instagram. <laughs> That's really what this was all about. Yes. Yeah, link in notes. Um, you know, it's a great question. I, I, we, we did this project on the beach called Aqua. And it was, you know, like the most famous residential project in Miami Beach at its time. Harvard came and studied it. Rizzoli did a book on it. I mean, to market a project like this, we needed to buy some ads in the Miami Herald maybe buy an ad on the New York Times Magazine once a month, get some amazing PR, so if you got a story in the New York Times and you know some of the magazines and all the amazing local publications like the Miami Herald and you threw a few parties, you were like the marketing genius of the century. I mean, that, that made Aqua famous and, and today it is so confusing um, how to market because it's essentially become diffused. It used to be controlled by, by very concrete channels. And now there are so many different ways and everybody is their own media company. You know, like everyone is their own magazine. What, what is a Facebook page or an Instagram? Uh, you know, like it, it's, it, it, you are your own magazine or your own newspaper and it's challenging. I think that social media is really important. We invest a lot in social media. I also, I was joking, but I do my own um, Instagram and I, I do it more like because it's fascinating how much you learn when you engage in this in, in this stuff and now we meet so many of uh, of the influencers because they're they're coming around and a lot of places like they want to charge fees if people want to do photo shoots and things in the design district I mean there's like a hundred photo shoots that happen here a day you know from someone taking a selfie to an Olympic athlete with a crew of six. Um, and I, I, I think it really like, it, it, having a place where people want to be photographed is an important part of any business success going forward. That's great. 
Well, before, before I guess, we finally wrap, because we're almost being chased off stage here, but... Um, I own the building, don't worry. Oh, perfect. Good. It's good to know somebody. <laughs> I got your back. Perfect. Um, we always close every episode asking for a cultural recommendation, and I think, you know, we're in a pretty lucky position that I can't really think of anyone better to give a, a Miami-based uh, cultural recommendation than you, so... Can you give us something that, you know, whether it's for folks here when they're, they're done here today or people listening the next time they're in Miami, something they should definitely go check out? So there are these little booklets, but just first of all, walk around the design district. There are amazing art, architecture, and design installations from Mark Newson's Fence to Zaha Hadid's Elastica to Urs Fisher's Bus Stop. Um, and, you know, the Museum Garage, a lot of things I mentioned. And then um, I suggest you go into the ICA and the Dela Cruz, uh, two museums, one privately owned, one public, both which are free, um, and that's very important to us. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things you could do in this neighborhood without spending any money, um, and that means a lot to me. And then go up to the Larry Bell Show and do what I recently did with Kanye West. Uh, you need another person, but one of Larry's installations is there's like two chairs facing each other and there's this kind of like mirrored kind of contraption in the middle. And what happens is your friend sits in one chair and you sit in the other and you merge into one person. You kind of got to line up your noses. Um, but like with Kanye, all of a sudden I had hair. It was miraculous. <laughs> and so, um, and, you know, that's like a, a great artwork. It's a historical work by Larry's. It'll be up for a while. So that's where I suggest you end your cultural journey in the Miami Design District. I think James and I know where we're going right That's after That's a great this. tip. Yeah. You so both have cool. hair. That, you know, so. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us. This was great. It's, it's amazing to have you host everybody here this weekend. And uh, I'm excited to go check some stuff out. I've never been here before. Thank you, guys. Thank awesome. you so much. Really Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming.